Today, I didn't do any formulas pretty much, but just animations. Today, I'm going to make up for it, and it's going to be mostly formulas. Uh, but uh, the idea is to try to see how, uh, you know, gravitational waves don't come out magically out of uh, metric theories and Einstein equations, but rather they, um, rather they, uh, they express some basic physical truths, okay, some basic f physical facts in the theory. So in preparing for this uh, lecture, I looked around at what, uh, uh, what kind of, you know, explanations and what kind of developments you can find. And there are probably a couple dozen, a couple dozen, right? If you look in various books on the web, everybody is doing a kind of a variant on uh, doing linearized field equations for uh, the gravitational field, uh, gravitational waves, and so on. Um, so I, I quickly, um, so I'm giving you a bit of a, of a mix of different uh, uh, treatments and different ideas, but uh, uh, if you pick up one of these three books, pretty much, you, you cannot go wrong. Uh, the first one, Einstein Gravity is a Nutshell, is actually, it doesn't have that much about gravitational waves, but it, it's, a, it's a very nice book about uh, gravity that's all about uh, physics and intuition and, and uh, how things fit together. It's also written by field theorists, so it kind of has that uh, the kind of approach. Uh, in Z is interested in symmetry, in uh, in groups, in uh, uh, in putting things together, you know, writing Lagrangians out of symmetry. Uh, so it's it's a very pleasant read, very nice. The second one is a, is a recent textbook in uh, gravitational waves by uh, two colleagues of mine at the University of uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee. It's uh, um, it's somewhat formal in its uh, treatment, uh, development of equations, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's rather complete and it's not too verbose, okay? So it, it gets there quickly. So um, I, I do recommend that book, although there's a couple of formulas in there that uh, uh, come out of my papers and they don't cite me. So I'm a, I'm a little, they should have said that's the Valisneri formula, the Valisneri cutler formula or something like that. But anyway, the third one uh, is a long awaited textbook. So uh, uh, modern classical physics, application of classical physics is a course that has been taught at, uh, um, at Caltech for the last 20 years, maybe. And the book was always going to come out next year. So it seems now it's, it's slated for February, but all this time you've been able to find basically the entire book in chapters on the web. And uh, uh, so that's what I was looking at also. So it's, uh, if, you, if you Google something like um, a PH, right, physics uh, 136, Caltech, you'll get it. And it's, uh, it's, it's rather interesting. It's, uh, it's, it's a very brief and quick roll through pretty much all of classical physics. It, it does uh, general relativity in, in one chapter, okay, and gravitational waves in the second chapter. It does statistical physics in one chapter. It's perhaps it's not the first book you should read about any of these things, but uh, if you want to go back to it in kind of like the notation and in the, in, in the, from the viewpoint that's useful for astrophysics and for gravitational waves, that, that's pretty good. Okay, so lots of formulas, but, but the point is that um, these are the things I want you to remember if you know them already, if you've had uh, a course in general relativity or gravitational waves, or maybe if you don't, I want you to take away from today. Um, and these are all uh, rather, these are all physical statements, okay? So in the, in the history of general relativity, um, Einstein came up with the gravitational waves quadrifold formula pretty early in 1916. Although he had a mistake, he first didn't believe in them, he, he believed in them, in them again. So there was, there was quite, quite a bit of, uh, uh, of confusion in the, uh, about the subject and about this topic for many years, until probably the 1950s. And so it, it took that long for, uh, to, to get a solid physical understanding of, uh, of gravitational waves and, and to take them from a rather formal aspect of uh, um, a rather formal aspect of, of general relativity to something physical, okay? Now, um, because of that, uh, you know, statement one, okay, so most, uh, m most uh, treatments of uh, gravitational waves focus on the metric. 
you take the metric, which is the basic general relativistic uh, quantity, describes the geometry of space-time. You look at small perturbations uh, of the metric around either flat space-time or maybe some background, and you, you have this object H, you know, for, for gravitational wave, and you start playing with it, and you show that it obeys a wave equation, and that's a gravitational wave. That is what Einstein did, and that's what confused Einstein, because uh, general relativity has this coordinate invariance, okay? So you can, uh, the, the equations don't change whatever coordinate frame you use to write them, but that means also that uh, uh, this freedom that you have to, uh, you can mistake this freedom for actual physics. So when Einstein was writing uh, uh, equations for gravitational waves in 1916 and 18, he, he was finding some, some solutions that looked like waves, but they were just really coordinates. And he found those uh, either didn't propagate or didn't seem to carry energy. So to cut it short, uh, it's, it's the easiest way to do the equations is to look at the perturbations of the metric. But that can be confusing because you have a problem in choosing coordinates. So uh, another viewpoint that Pirani and, uh, and later Thorne took is that you can take the curvature. Okay, as, you, as your basic uh, physical element. The curvature is, uh, involves derivatives of the metric. It's, uh, it's embodied by the Riemann, uh, uh, the Riemann tensor, which unfortunately has four indices. Okay, so you have to work, to work with something with four indices, whereas in uh, electromagnetism, you know, two are okay. But then you can work at the level of the Riemann tensor. You can, you can show that curvature uh, also obeys a wave equation. And now curvature is something more physical, right? It's something that we can relate to the uh, um, to covariant differentiation and so to the transport of vector. So some, some, a physical geometrical operation on, on, your, uh, on your curve space time. So that means that this thing then that's traveling like a wave is really a physical quantity. Okay, so that's one. Then we're going to see that uh, the wave that curvature manifests itself is a, as tidal forces. So tidal forces are things that uh, you know, don't, don't push on the center of mass of uh, you know, some, um, some physical system, but just pull it apart or together, just like the moon is doing on the Earth or so on. Um, then we're going to, to see that gravitational waves are transverse, so they act uh, in a direction orthogonal to the direction of propagation, and they, they do carry energy momentum. This was another big point of confusion for Einstein and for, uh, for many um, General relativists, many relativists in the, in the first years of the theory, um, because to, to attribute some energy momentum to gravitational waves, you have to, um, to give something away, which is locality. So you cannot exactly localize energy in gravitational waves. You have to do some averaging. If you accept to do that, however, everything is fine, and the energy momentum of uh, gravitational waves is very real. Um, since, after all, you can detect them, okay? You can, and any detection of a physical uh, phenomenon must involve some transfer of energy. And finally, we're going to go to mass, to gravitational wave generation. So gravitational waves are emitted by, uh, at the dominant, the dominant emission is from a time-dependent quadruple of mass. And because of that, uh, the prototypical binary system has a quadruple, is going to lose energy to gravitational waves, and is going to have an accelerating spiral. And you'd think that uh, point six is kind of obvious, right? After all, that's how we think that gravitational waves are, that's how we established they existed from the house Taylor pulsar. But that was also a big point of uh, contention uh, because it was a little embarrassing to think that the Keplerian orbits, or at least the orbits of planets and binary stars, were not just closed uh, stationary solutions. You know, they would go on forever. Uh, so, in, in fact, many thought that, uh, um, yes, you can have gravitational waves, but somehow the system, where a binary system where you have two masses going around each other, because of some internal consistency, maybe that system doesn't emit, because things balance out, and uh, so, so you keep this, uh, you know, this comfortable uh, stationary eternal configuration that has helped uh, astronomy for so long. Okay, so let's go into formulas then, but you, you'll, you'll recognize some of this. And uh, the point in having them there is that, uh, you know, kind of look at the, yes? Number four, so the, the energy momentum in gravitational waves? In locality, is that, is that right? 
Yes, it can only be localized if you average over wavelengths. Okay, that's, that's the, the kind of like the physical viewpoint. No, I think in a, if you look at the pointing vector in, e, in EM, if you look at the energy momentum tensor for electromagnetism, you can pretty much uh, have a well-defined uh, um, energy momentum at any given point in the field, actually, or, or in a wave. Uh, it's true there's a gauge freedom, okay, so the potential, you can, you can change the potential and you can, uh, you, you can use, you can apply transformations to it, but uh, uh, energy momentum classically, at least, is well defined. If you go to quantum, then, you know, may, may, maybe uh, you have to take an expectation value, but, uh, uh, but you say that's right, so. Um, okay, let's go back here. Uh, metric theories of gravity, Raphael was describing them yesterday. Basic element is the metric, okay? So your description, your generalization of Pythagoras theorem that tells you if you move away in coordinates how much proper distance you make. Of course, here we're talking about pseudo Riemannian uh, manifolds, so there's a time direction that has the opposite sign, but it doesn't really change much. Um, from the metric, or, or even just from the idea of uh, a uh, curve space time, uh, you come to the idea of covariant differentiation. So what is that? That's, uh, you can look at that rather formally, but the, the main point is that uh, um, if you're just looking at the scalar field, just uh, you know, numbers as a function of space, it's not a problem to put those on a curve uh, manifold. However, if you look at vector, uh, you run into a problem because a, a vector is defined in a local tangent plane, and the local tangent plane changes as you move across the um, as you move across the manifold. So you, you have to do something particular to, uh, to take derivatives of vectors or to move vectors around and compare them. The easiest way to think about it is uh, to, you know, to lose Riemann for a moment and go back to Gauss and think of a manifold as embedded in a larger flat space, in a Euclidean space. In that case, all that covariant uh, differentiation does is uh, you, know, you have a vector here, you want to move it here, you just move it rigidly in the embedding Euclidean space, and you just project it back, flatten it back onto the manifold. If you write that into formulas, you know, uh, you write in a derivative, you take in a derivative both of the components of the vector and of the kind of like the basis uh, field, and you have three terms, and, of we, and you just lose the terms that's uh, uh, normal to your manifold. Okay, so, and then uh, the piece that you have is the standard uh, uh, coordinate partial uh, derivative and a piece with these gammas, you know, the Christoffel symbols uh, that kind of are, are related to the change in, the, in your basis vectors. This is not a tensor, right? They're symbols. Uh, but together, these things transforms like a tensor. And this, uh, this was a big achievement when mathematicians came to it. It was actually um, Ricci. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Levi Civita, working at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, because once you have this derivative, you can take all of your standard physics, classical physics that you used to writing either in Euclidean space or in Lorentz space, and you can just bring it into any curve space time. That's, that's what general relativity does. Uh, this is how, if you have a metric, of course, uh, Riemann actually showed that uh, you don't need an embedding space all the information that you need is already in your metric, and therefore you can write the, the Christoffel symbols from uh, ju just the metric. And these equations down here, actually I should start getting into the Socratic thing, but uh, uh, the, these are, uh, okay, what, what's that? This, uh, this is the velocity, okay, of a, an observer, the velocity of a particle. Uh, and then what does this equation represent? Who remembers GR? Come on, yeah. Is the, is the, yeah, it's the geodesic equation for, for a time-like particle. So you're, you're transporting the velocity as straight as you can. Uh, that also gives you the, um, a trajectory with a maximal proper length okay, in space. So that's the equation of motion, pretty much, in the absence of other forces. If you add the M or so on, you could put them on, on the other side here. Okay, that's parallel transport. Uh, now, I didn't start my timer, so I'm going to give myself... Okay, Riemann, uh, what's curvature? We know how to transport vectors. Uh, the way that curvature works is that if you transport a vector along two different paths, uh, you're going to end up with different vectors at the end. Okay, so the transport uh, of vectors doesn't commute with doing different paths. We're going in different directions in general. 
it certainly doesn't on the Earth, okay? So if you take this vector u and uh, take it along two other directions in, in different orders, you're going to up with, end up with different vectors, and the difference between those is uh, uh, encoded by the Riemann tensor. Uh, you can also write it formally as just, you know, the commutator of uh, uh, covariant uh, derivatives. And this is a linear operation in the, in the vector uh, w. Again, you can write this as derivatives and products uh, of, uh, uh, of the Christoffel symbols if you're working with a metric. Um, but this, right, although there are symbols, there are indexes, and the formulas are always confusing, uh, it's a physical thing. Okay? It's something that expresses how space-time is curved. Now, um, the Riemann tensor has lots of components, but actually they, uh, they're they very um, redundant. Okay? They, so, so there are lots of symmetries and lots of internal relations in, uh, in the Riemann tensor that end up, uh, that express kind of like its internal consistency and how curved space-time uh, is consistent with itself uh, when, when you study its curvature. And that consistency is actually what gets you eventually the wave equation for curvature and the four gravitational waves. So the, for instance, the, uh, what was called, uh, was known as the first Bianchi identities is something where you, uh, you're, you're just, uh, you know, um, taking permutations of indices, the cyclic permutation of indices, the, the, you know, the race, the race index is where you apply the metric, but it doesn't really mean, uh, that's not too, too, too important here. The point is, again, uh, this can be seen as a, as a geometrical uh, fact, which is that uh, if you're taking um, the most general case of taking alpha, beta, gamma is going along three directions, okay, in, uh, in a curved space. So if you do this Riemann difference, the, the difference between uh, t taking, moving a vector along two different paths, uh, along all uh, three axes, uh, you end up with three different uh, uh, vectors, and they, they do have to form a triangle, okay, the differences between these three vectors, just, just because the, the dimensions close upon themselves. So that's what this uh, uh, Bianchi identity shows. Uh, there are also uh, internal symmetries. So, for instance, Riemann is uh, anti-symmetric in the first two indices, is anti-symmetric in, uh, which is kind of obvious, right, because it is just the order in which you do the, the commutator. It's anti-symmetric in the second two indices, which is not that obvious, uh, because it's saying that uh, uh, the vector that you're transporting and the vector you end up with also have this kind of uh, anti-symmetric relation, but this com comes out of, uh, um, comes out of the fact that uh, this is the curvature for a given metric, and uh, in a metric you can put tensors together to make scalars, and so by, by conserving uh, conserving that, you get this, and also, uh, also a little more surprising, uh, Riemann is symmetric under exchange in the first pair of indices with the second pair of indices. So you start putting these things together, and the number of uh, independent components go down to 20, I think. Now, second Bianchi identities, this is the most complicated formula I have here, and uh, there, there are, it's a somewhat you know, second order thing. Uh, th there are many interpretations of, uh, of this, many ways to look at it. Um, if you just, uh, j just a statement is that uh, the, um, if you take a combination of three derivatives of Riemann, covariant derivatives, again, uh, permuting indices somehow, uh, you get zero. Okay, so, so it's, it's an identity equal to zero. Um, for instance, a, a beautiful way to look at it is to kind of do this work using Cartan's uh, differential form uh, theory, uh, which leads you to, to express this identity as saying that the boundary of a boundary is zero. If you go to gravitation, Mr. Tom Wheeler, that's how they do it. I kind of like this view of it, which is you're doing, again, this uh, transport, uh, uh, this Riemann transport of, uh, of vectors and you're doing it along, around all sides of a cube. So doing it on the bottom side, for instance, and the high side, the difference between these two is what the derivative is of, of Riemann. You do it on all of them, and then you end up going around, uh, transporting around each edge of the cube twice in different directions, so that must be zero. So again, this looks formally, you know, like a magic identity. In practice, it's something related to the consistency of, uh, of curvature and how it's, uh, it's expressed in, in, in geometry. Um, so, in practice, it's hard to not be 
to not be formal at some points. You know, when you derive equation at some point, you're just juggling indices and uh, substituting things. But it's good to remember that all, all these things have physical meanings, okay? And then we go to, uh, I, I think you've seen this and in your courses, but also the last couple of days, uh, Einstein's equations. Uh, so Einstein uh, uh, struggled to, uh, to find the right object describing curvature that uh, you know, gives you gravitational physics. And, but finally, he found it in uh, the Einstein tensor. So Ricci, you get by uh, saturating one of the indices here, collapsing one, uh, two, two of the indices of Riemann. Uh, you can do one more. Um, and, and get the, the Ricci curvature, which is a scalar. And then this combination is a combination that uh, is divergence-free, so it's appropriate to match up with an energy momentum tensor, which needs to be, convert, uh, needs to be conserved okay, locally in curved space-time. So these are Einstein's equations, and uh, um, the, the other principle that, uh, that Einstein used to put these together, of course, is to try to do, go to the Newtonian limit. Uh, then you get a very simple... Um, energy momentum tensor, the dominant piece is the T00, where you have the density of mass, and that you, you needs to go back into, uh, to, to match up with something that's kind of like the, uh, uh, the Poisson potential. Um, okay, Richie, Richie, and Einstein. Now, uh, let's go to a weak field. Let's go to linearized gravity, uh, because we're going to postulate that gravitational waves are going to be a very weak phenomenon. And we'll start actually with waves on a, on a flat space time, just on a Minkowski standard uh, metric. Um, you don't, we don't, don't need to remember any of this, but just to show that uh, um, if we do this, uh, um, this hypothesis, then uh, we can replace all uh, uh, covariant derivatives just with the um, ordinary derivatives, and that the expressions for curvature are somewhat simpler to first order in, in H. Uh, these are the infinitesimal coordinate transformations, so which are appropriate, the kind of gauge freedom that's appropriate to keep at this level. And now, uh, one thing here that's, uh, that's very, very interesting is that uh, uh, this object, Riemann for linearized field, is actually gauge invariant with respect to these transformations. So that's kind of what's nice in, in working at the level of Riemann instead of the level of the linearized metric, because in that case, the choice of a gauge very much changes you know, your, your linearized metric, but here it doesn't, okay? So we're working with something physical. It's not entirely invariant. I, you know, if you do a Lorentz transformation here, if you do rotations, of course, it has to change and the, uh, you know, the, has to change in the right way, but it is with respect to a coordinate transformation. So that's, that, that's, you know, that's comforting. It means we're doing something physical at this level. And, okay, th this is my punchline, but I was going to, to ask you, how do you write wave in mathematics? And you've seen it, right? So that's how you write wave in mathematics. So something like, uh, something like this in three plus one dimensions. So the job then is to show that uh, the Riemann tensor actually obeys a wave equation like that. Okay, so here we need a little bit of uh, uh, formalism, but we go back to the second Bianchi identity, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, mu, plus alpha, beta, delta, mu, gamma, plus alpha, beta, mu, gamma, delta. Okay, and then uh, in a vacuum, okay, we're working outside of a source, we're working just where the waves propagate, uh, we have that, the Ricci tensor, Zero. Okay, that, that's just Einstein, Einstein's equation in the vacuum if t is, uh, is zero. Um, now, uh, that means that we can, uh, uh, what we can do is to take, take Riemann with run uh, uh, raised index. So we're actually going to take this equation And uh, alpha, we're going to, to collapse by saying that alpha is mu, okay? So we're going to multiply by uh, eta alpha mu, effectively. So that gives us our mu 
beta gamma delta comma mu plus r mu beta delta mu gamma plus r mu beta mu gamma delta equals zero. So I've just rewritten the Bianca identity and multiplied it by the metric so that I'm, uh, uh, I'm collapsing the uh, alpha mu indices. So now what you see that just by the fact that Ricci is zero, I can throw away this term and I can throw away this term. This one is different though because it's, uh, it doesn't make Ricci because the, the index that's the same is the index that I'm uh, differentiating with respect to. So what this says that is that Riemann, the divergence of Riemann is zero and actually because of uh, Riemann's internal symmetries, uh, Riemann is divergence free on every index. Every single index that you do this, uh, um, this collapsing gives you zero. Okay, Riemann's divergence is free in every index. That's kind of nice. So let's take, uh, then, let's start from here again. And let's take another derivative, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, mu, mu. And we're going to build the D'Alembert version, okay? Take a, a sum over derivatives over the same index. And then we have alpha, beta, delta, gamma, delta mu, gamma mu, plus alpha, beta, mu, delta mu. Okay, and since uh, uh, these are just uh, regular derivatives in this weak field limit, we can turn around, switch over these two derivatives. So this end ends up being a divergence of Riemann, it goes away. This is another divergence of Riemann, it goes away. So we're left with this. Okay, just as we promised, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, is zero. So that means that uh, the, the Riemann tensor admits wave-like solutions, okay, and propagates like a wave. And all that I needed was the internal structure and the internal consistency of curvature plus the Einstein equation. So this is true in Einstein's theory in vacuum for a weak field. Okay, so uh, questions? Yes. In, in what? What did I do where with the bottom line here? Okay, I, I took just the derivative of this, uh, of the Bianchi, second Bianchi identity with respect to mu. So see this mu, there's one more mu there. And then uh, two terms are just uh, derivatives of divergences, they're zero, and the other term is just the wave equation, the, the wave operator, the Lambert on, on Riemann. Okay, oh, uh, now I can give you some literature, actually. So um, I, I was talking yesterday about this book by Italo Calvino, who is a very beloved Italian author, and uh, it's called Cosmic Comics. It's, uh, it's not quite sci-fi, it's more like this whimsical uh, stories about um, science, yeah, really, deeply science. It's, it clearly was learning about cosmology and about general relativity and was trying to express what he learned in, in a literary way. And there's this story, uh, which is really about geodesic deviation. And it's, uh, it's about this guy who's falling. Actually, not, not even just the, the equation. It's also about the equivalence principle because it says, you know, we were falling all the time. Uh, you can read this while I, uh, while I talk. Uh, we're falling all, all the time. Couldn't even tell if we were falling. We might have been uh, um, just standing still in vacuum, in nothing. So that's the equivalence principle for you. But there were three of them, and there was, uh, you know, uh, the uh, protagonist and this uh, uh, beguiling character, Ursula HX. Uh, who he'd really like to get close to, and this uh, uh, enemy of his, Lieutenant Fenimore. So all the while, he's kind of hoping, hoping that his uh, free fall is going to get him closer to, to Ursula, but worried when, uh, uh, you know, it seems that instead she's going towards uh, Lieutenant Fenimore. So that's geodesic evasion, okay? So you're, you're falling freely, but since space-time may be curved, he doesn't really know at this point, um, lines that are parallel could converge or diverge. So for the formulas, um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, not surprisingly, the, uh, this geodesic deviation equation involves Riemann, involves the, uh, uh, the known commutation of, uh, um, of covariant derivatives, because if you move a little away from, uh, from your uh, 
a time like geodesic, uh, you know, that's, that's a differentiation. If you, if you move towards the future, it's another differentiation, so that's how it looks. But the thing that's kind of important physical, physically is that you can look at it geometrically as curvature, but physically, this is really analog to tidal fields in Newtonian theory. Okay, if you just have uh, acceleration due to a, a potential, so the, to the grad of the potential, and if you now look at the relative acceleration of two particles that are both in the same field, well, that relative acceleration is going to be proportional to the second derivative of your potential. Okay, so to a mixed second derivative times the separation. So this uh, E, Ij, these second derivatives, is a tidal field. Now, this equation is analog to the equation down here, although there are more indices. In particular, if your particle is at rest, then this uh, uh, velocity vector is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay? And then the components of Riemann that are going to give you uh, relative acceleration are just going to be the 0, i, 0, j, the time spatial, time spatial components. So this vector here for a particle at rest, or in cases where velocities are very small, so things that are moving non, very non-relativistically, very slowly, is entirely analog to the Newtonian tidal field. Any questions here? This is central to, um, to thinking about gravitational waves in a physical way. Okay? Uh, uh, so there's actually, um, yeah, they're analog. <laughs> so so uh, Kip Thorne and uh, his students, uh, the, the last thing that he did before retiring and becoming a Hollywood icon was, uh, uh, was to try to look again at this, uh, uh, this phenomenology of tidal fields in a physical way. And he came up with this idea of tendexes and vortices, vortexes. And what the tendex is, is uh, uh, you have a field, so uh, uh, you cannot quite do, like with the electric field, you cannot quite do... Uh, for lines of force, but uh, you can look at the eigendirections and eigenvectors of the field and try to draw them. And uh, in these tendex lines that express the, uh, the content of, a, of the tidal, that field show you where you'd be either stretched, okay, for the positive ones, the red ones, or where you'd be compressed if you're oriented along those lines. So it's a graphical way of uh, expressing the content of uh, um, the tidal field, and there's also a, uh, um, the counterpart to it is that if you look at the uh, Riemann components with the three indices, okay, those coupled to velocity in the uh, geodesic equation, deviation equation, so they're kind of like a, a magnetic potential in a way. They're uh, a torque, they're, they're a frame drag, and that's what the, the, he calls them a frame drag fields, field, uh, which give you the rotation of a, uh, of a gyroscope. So again, if you're in this, uh, in this vortex field, um, uh, the local frame, frame drag field will tell you how you're rotating. And there's actually, if you put this thing together just in, uh, uh, effectively in the Bianchi identity, what you get is equations that are formally the same as electromagnetism. And you can push this uh, analogy forward and pretty much you have the same equations except for some coefficients. Um, you, you, this is called gravito electromagnetism, and it is where you're looking at the um, uh, space, uh, at the sorry, electric and magnetic parts of the Riemann tensor and its effects on uh, on motion. Of course, this breaks, you know, symmetry. You shouldn't really separate this thing. It's better to look at the whole thing. But if you're moving slowly, it's not a bad way to do it. Okay, um, what now? Now then, uh, we have a. Um, we have established that Riemann propagates as a wave, so we're going to say that it propagates along a specific direction, along z. And we, we're going to try to understand what the effect on uh, uh, particles is of having such a perturbation of, uh, um, of curvature. And the idea is that, so, so that's the equation that, um, so if we just define this H. This H is not a metric at this point. It would, it's just my definition of the gravitational wave field. Define it as the second integral or vice versa. We define this uh, time space, time space component of Riemann as the second derivative of this. You see that the effect on uh, local particles is just going to be proportional uh, to this gravitational field times their displacement. Okay, is, is this clear? Yes.
Say again, sorry. Can't I don't feel... Of extrinsic curvature. So again, you're looking at an embedding and... Uh, um, I, I'm sure, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you can do something like that. And it's, uh, by this point, uh, we, we're back into three plus one, uh, into our space time and so on, and it's, uh, we don't want to go, what do you need to embed from three plus one, 11, 12, or in general? 10, 10, right, so. Um, okay, so then uh, the, what does this look like? Okay, so that, that's uh, um, the, the zero, this, uh, time space, time space components of Riemann. Uh, we're going to look at waves that are propagating along Z. And so you can, you can, you can look at these components individually, or the components of the gravitational field, the H, uh, H, G, GW. And for instance, if you look at the Z, Z component of it, what effect is this going to give you? Uh, the effect is going to be that uh, uh, if you have particles that are um, displaced along the direction of propagation a little bit, they're going to get more displaced when the field is positive or less displaced. So it's going to be a longitudinal oscillation in, uh, in the motion of uh, uh, nearby particles immersed in this wave. If you look at the longitudinal, uh, at the kind of like XZ or YZ, well, that's going to be, uh, again, a motion that, uh, uh, that moves particles in a, uh, in a mixed uh, direction. Okay, and uh, uh, if you're going to look at the uh, XX or YY uh, or XY field, well, those are effects that are going to take a ring of particles in a plane orthogonal to the propagation of the wave, and they're going either to expand it and squish it like a circle or to, uh, to do an uh, ellipsoidal effect of squishing along one direction and uh, uh, um, uh, lengthening uh, along the other one. So it's kind of, uh, um, it's, that's kind of the way that you want to look at, uh, uh, at these components by um, taking little matrices, matrices in, you know, x, y, x, y. Uh, you look at uh, a component that has the same x, x, and x, y components that has the opposite them and then is along the, uh, the diagonal. So that's a symmetric uh, tensor. So between these three, th these are the only ones that I can write. Uh, these uh, exhaust the entire freedom that I have to write components. Um, now, that's not what I had promised, okay? There's, a, there's more modes, there's more polarization modes that uh, the, I, I told you there are in, in uh, general relativity. And that's because uh, uh, I, I've actually left uh, something back. Uh, I, I'm taking just any um, tidal gravitational wave tensor uh, propagating al along the, the z direction. I have not imposed the Einstein equations. Okay, if I go back and impose the Einstein equations, uh, which you can do by taking, uh, you know, Ricci again and looking at sums and differences, you end up showing that uh, uh, the longitudinal, longitudinal transverse and transverse spin zero components of the uh, gravitational field have to be zero in GR. If you have a different theory, okay, if your field equations are not quite in vacuum this, but maybe there's another term coupling, I don't know, to Ricci or another field or whatnot, uh, then you can have all five modes in general. But in GR, you only have these two transverse modes. You see this, uh, it says spin zero, spin one, spin zero, spin one, spin two. This is kind of like the field theoretical classification of uh, this perturbation. And one way to look at it is by looking at what, what happens when you do rotations in the plane orthogonal to the direction of propagation. Spin zero means that, uh, um, okay, so let's take this, uh, this thing that gives you just a, uh, an expansion of a circle and shrinking of a circle alternatively. If you do a rotation, what, what, what's the rotation? Any rotation brings it into itself, basically. It's just invariant with respect to rotation, that's spin zero. Uh, if you've got this longitudinal um, transverse, well, you need a full rotation of 360 degrees to go back to the, the same perturbation, so that's spin one. Uh, if you have this uh, real GR mode, gravitational wave mode that are ellipses like that, if you do a rotation of 180 degrees, that brings you back into yourself again. So that's why spin two, 360 degrees divided by 2180. That's the, uh, the return angle is, is known technically. So spin is a group 
right, a, a, a groupal um, concept in, in field theory. So we've down from six independence degrees of freedom to just two in general relativity. And just to give you an idea, uh, to, to, to reiterate how they, um, how they behave, so you can write this uh, tidal field as a sum of two pieces, a plus and a cross polarization, uh, in this case H plus and uh, H cross. These are polariza the polarization tensors which I was trying to write here. So one is a, a, a trace free, uh, symmetric trace free around the diagonal. The other one is uh, again, again symmetric and, and, and trace free. And the, uh, if you have a, uh, say a sinusoidal um, function for the plus, for the plus polarization is going to take a circle of particles and is going to squish it in uh, alternatingly along the two dimensions. And the cross polarization will do the same, but it will do so in, at a 45 degree angle. Uh, if you look at the forces at the tidal field, that's kind of how they look like. And the, this, that's, these forces, once you integrate them, they, they give you this kind of motion. Um, this is how this thing transformed with respect to rotation in the, uh, in the plane orthogonal to propagation. So this is the physical effect. I was thinking it was my statement three of uh, uh, transverse effect of the waves, as a, as a, of gravitational waves as they, they propagate. Okay, everything good here? So see, this is, uh, uh, we're not talking about metrics here. We're actually talking about real physical motion of nearby particle in a local, uh, in the proper frame. You know, if you put a particle at the middle, it doesn't move at all because we're looking at tidal relative motions here. Um, and that's the effect that uh, gravitational wave detectors have to try to see. It's a physical thing, okay? So um, local nearby particles are moving with respect to each other. If you want to look at the, vortex, at the tendex field for it, it's not very inspiring, but uh, you know, that's, that's how it looks like. And the colors will alternate, I suppose, as you change the phase of the wave. Um, now, if you go back to one of the more standard uh, treatments of the gravitational waves, uh, there, there's a big deal about this TT, transverse traceless gauge, that gives you a special form of the metric. And the idea is, um, if you look at what the metric is that gives you this uh, tidal effect on this geodesic deviation on nearby particles, it would look like something like this, okay? Your, um, your time, space, time, space, Riemann components would enter in the T00 component of the metric because you need them there to you know, take the right derivative and end up with the geodesic equation. So this is a metric that is a, is a proper reference frame because at the origin is just Lorentz. It's just uh, it's locally flat. And then as you move away from it, there's this tidal, uh, this curvature that manifests itself into a tidal field. So that's, that's very physical, especially if we look only at, at the geodesic deviation equation and we, we don't try to do distances here. However, uh, another, uh, that's appropriate, for instance, if you're talking about the LIGO, Virgo, and uh, you want to think of the uh, mirrors, at the end mirrors as moving due to forces. So you can say, okay, I'm, I'm in this proper frame, that's what I'm going to describe it. Say, however, you want to describe LISA. Okay, LISA is big enough uh, that uh, uh, this expansion, uh, local expansion of the metric is not correct anymore uh, because LISA is as a size comparable actually to the gravitational waves themselves. So to describe something like that, uh, you probably want to work uh, with a description of, uh, with a metric description that's, this, that's constant, that's homogeneous across the entire extent of the wave, across space. So what you can show is that you can do a transformation of variables that takes you into a metric that has this form. Okay, all that you need to do is to match the curvature locally, and that's all your physics, and the, four, the, uh, the resulting metric expresses the same geometry, the same curvature, and the same physics. And uh, this is very nice and very simple, and in, in particular, the, um, the gravitational wave uh, uh, polarizations, components appear only in the, uh, in the space uh, section of the metric. And then what this, uh, this is interesting because if you, if you go in and do the um, geodesic equation for a particle that's initially at rest in that metric, it doesn't move at all. So if you have two uh, nearby particles that are just going along, the, along their way and a wave comes, the coordinates don't change. In this matrix, particles don't move. What happens is that the coordinates are moving. 
Okay, and, uh, and therefore, um, physically, the distances are changing in the same way as we saw before, being stretched and squeezed, but we're also moving the coordinates with the distances so that the, uh, you can describe your particles as not changing, at ha having constant coordinates effectively. So the, implicitly, it's the coordinate field here that's being stretched and squeezed uh, together with the particles. And then uh, uh, the way that uh, w what the particle will see is that the distance to the nearby one changes because to make the distance, you have to integrate along the metric. You know, you have to do Pythagoras theorem with the metric. And uh, so in that description, the particle are not moving, but it's the distance between them that changes because the gravitational wave is coming by. So see, this description is dual to the, one, the other one, but in terms of what you can observe physically, it's entirely equivalent. You can either, have, uh, you can either measure your distances with the, uh, with the Lorentz metric and have things move, or you can have them not move and change the distance between them because the metric changes, like in cosmology. But, um, any question here? Um, I, I think all of GR does kind of this uh, schizophrenia, <laughs> almost, where uh, Einstein was so proud that the theory was uh, generally covariant, you can use any coordinates and so on. In practice, when you, work, you, you want to work with it, you have to pick a, uh, the, the best coordinates to describe your physics, and, and then you, you really try to stay attached to them and, and get the physical meaning from them. Uh, in some cases, you can pick more than one, and they give you, you know, complementary descriptions of the same physics. But if you do the numbers, and if you, uh, you know, if you write what uh, your experiment must come out, it must come out the same. So that's the TT frame for you. Uh, let's go on to talk about energy momentum content of gravitational waves. Uh, this was, as I was saying, the origin of much confusion. Uh, because uh, Einstein was trying to uh, wrote almost immediately a, an object that he called a, a, an energy momentum pseudotensor. And it was a pseudotensor because uh, uh, if you applied coordinate transformations to it, it would move energy effectively. For something like a wave, uh, you could either put the energy uh, where the wave was at the top or where it crossed zero. It was quite confusing. Okay, and, and, uh, and therefore people suspected for a long time that this was only, uh, the, the waves carried no energy at all uh, because the energy seemed only to come out of di differently depending on how you did coordinates. Uh, the physical somewhat pragmatic resolution to it is to think of gravitational waves as a small, you know, short wavelength perturbation on a smooth curvature solution on a smooth background. And then again, you can split uh, the, uh, the field into two pieces, a background and a, uh, a wave-like perturbation. You can do the same for Riemann. And to, uh, the important thing is that there's, an, there's going to be an averaging operation. We can, you can think of it like one of these, a smoothing filter, right? So, so you're just going to do a local integral, a bit like doing Photoshop when you want to, to blur images. Uh, that smoothing operation takes you from the, the entire uh, tensor back just to the uh, background component of it. Um, so now uh, we split also the Einstein tensor, G, remember, Ricci plus a combination of the metric and of the Ricci curvature into terms that are background terms, a term that's linear in your gravitational wave perturbation field and a term that's quadratic. If, if, and, that, and then you can apply Einstein's equation and so the background field doesn't see uh, background field could be cosmology, for instance, or it could be just, uh, I don't know, a, a, the, 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 the geometry around the black hole. Okay, so it's changing very smoothly with a, a, a large radius of curvature. Um, so that is its own solution. To for, if, you, if you look at the, uh, this equation at the linear order in H, you get Ricci equals zero, which is what gives you the propagation, the wave propagation equation for Riemann. If you look at the second order, um, if you include the second order, you have that uh, the um, time space average of terms that are quadratic in the gravitational waves come in together with the background. Since these terms are quadratic, they don't cancel out when you do an average. Okay, just like when you, you go to a, from a cosine to a cosine square, you take the integral, it doesn't cancel out. So that means that uh, uh, if you take things up to second order in the perturbation, then uh, uh, you, have to s you have to solve for the background curvature together with that, 
that means that this perturbation is going to affect uh, the background curvature. If you put it on the other side of the equation, right, I just put this on, on the other side with a minus sign, you can think of it as a, a, an energy momentum tensor as if it were matter in a sense. So you can rewrite your Einstein equation for the background curvature as being sourced by a, an energy momentum tensor that comes from the, uh, from the piece of the field that's quadratic in the gravitational wave perturbation. So it's, um, certainly, you know, Einstein's equations are nonlinear, so everything has to work together. But if you break up things into orders, you can push them on either side, and you can say that, uh, you know, again, uh, you, you have a, a content of energy in gravitational waves in this perturbation H that's going to curve space-time. That's what energy does, okay? So this is a physical effect. This is a very, very real thing. But you can only do it if you take this average over many wavelengths of the, of the, of the gravitational waves, exactly. Yes? Uh, yes, yes. And the, the way you see it in the equations is that uh, since we're expanding over a curved background, we can't quite use uh, um, normal derivatives. We have to use a covariant derivatives with respect to the background. So that changes a bit. Uh, that, that gives you lensing, for instance. So you, you do something uh, called the geometric optics uh, approximation to derive, uh, to show that uh, the, the wave field moves along, along geodesics of the background curvature. And... Um, and redshift is another manifestation of that if you look at the time, space, the time, time, and time, space components. So, yes. Um, okay, so now if we want to do this for a wave, we just have to uh, plug, uh, plug back Riemann into, uh, in, into the second order pieces of Einstein. I don't show them here because they're kind of messy, but uh, uh, you end up with a very simple expression for the energy momentum tensor of the wave, which is exactly analog to what you have in electromagnetism, in fact. You have derivatives of the potential field squared and sum up. So you get a, a symmetric expression with respect to the plus and uh, uh, cross polarizations. And if you put, put in a, um, so a wave that's propagating along the z direction would only have components in time z and, uh, and time time and zz, and they're all equal to the same. If you put in back in uh, uh, constants of uh, you know, c, g, and so on, and go dimensional, you see that the, the content of, uh, gravitation, of energy in gravitational wave is actually pretty high. So the, um, the flux of a wave of 10 to the minus 1 strain, something like what we detect with LIGO, uh, at the kilohertz, okay, so something that's oscillating kind of fast, is on the order of 0.3 watts per meter squared, which is uh, something like the luminosity, the, the flux that you get from the full moon. But as I was saying yesterday, although there's a lot of energy, uh, it doesn't, uh, space-time is very stiff, so a lot of energy like that only gives you a strain of 10 to the minus 21, and the effect in the motion of uh, relative particles is only that big, and you have to spend, you know, a billion dollars to to actually see it and detect it. But then you're very happy. Um, now, uh, let's go to the final, uh, final hassle, which is to look at the generation of gravitational waves. So I thought I had... Yeah, that's, that's a very good historical book about physics, uh, about just this kind of things that I was telling you. The initial debates about whether gravitational waves are, are real, uh, the, uh, the history of the quadrupole formula uh, for the generation of waves, and it's, uh, it's really a pleasant, very pleasant uh, reading. So, to, unfortunately, uh, to, to describe wave generation, I kind of have to go back to, to talking about the metric. Okay, and it's a, it's a little unwieldy to do it in, in terms of the Riemann tensor. So, you know, just allow it uh, for me. And uh, this is the thing that all the textbooks would usually have in the first page, which is uh, if, again, you're looking at the linearized perturbation of, uh, uh, of the metric, uh, you can put it into a form that looks like uh, a wave equation if you do some things. In particular, the thing that you want to do is to, to, to build what's called the trace-reversed metric perturbation. So you're just subtracting the trace of the this trace H of, of the field from itself. That kills some terms, make, makes it simpler. 
and you want to go in a, in a gauge, uh, use your freedom in doing coordinate transformations to, again, simplify things, and you want to, to go into a gauge where a, a, di a divergence of the field is zero. If you do that, you have something that looks like a wave equation. The nice thing is that you know how to solve that. Okay? You know how to solve that, for instance, for the electromagnetic potential using a retarded, retarded field solution, which is a, a, just an integral of uh, uh, your energy uh, momentum uh, tensor on the side over the extent of the source uh, divided by uh, this, um, this the, you know, one over the retarded radius, effectively, the distance on uh, uh, the, light, uh, the light had to propagate uh, to get to you. Um, so, um, okay, my laser is dying, but if, uh, so the, that's exactly equivalent, that's exactly analog to the expression for the electromagnetic field. Uh, however, that involves for the HIJs, which are the part that I want, because they do the tidal field, it involves the stress part of the energy momentum tensor, and that's, uh, stress is always something that's, that's hard to think about, uh, at least for me. It's uh, the zero, zero component of energy momentum, okay, that, I know what it is. The, the zero J, okay, that's momentum, but IJ, I start to have to think, okay, it pushes, what does it do? So, however, you can use just the conservation of the uh, energy momentum tensor, which is here, to kind of relate the stress to just the energy energy, the zero zero component. You use the, this magic tool of, uh, you know, uh, integration by parts, which always works in, uh, in theoretical physics, um, and it pops out these two coordinates, okay? So, the, you can rewrite this, uh, uh, this integral as an integral over only the, um, the mass density effectively, the energy density multiplied by local coordinates. So this is a mass quadrupole, right, this kind of integral. Um, and then, uh, this is just a definition. I'm going to define this as the mass quadrupole. I get a, a, a twice a time derivative to, to enforce conservation. And so my solution for the trace reverse gravitational field is, uh, uh, is going to be the second derivative of the, uh, the quadrupole. I've also simplified this uh, uh, time-retarded uh, uh, combination of uh, uh, coordinates into just the radius because I'm assuming that the source is moving very slowly. Okay, so uh, the final result, uh, I add this TT uh, combination to it because, uh, uh, do I have that? Yes. Um, there's something very expedient, which also has some uh, an interesting physical meaning, which is we saw that for a wave that propagates along Z, let's see, I only care about XX, XY, and XY and XYY. I don't care about the other components. And, uh, and, and in fact, I only need those components to build the Riemann tidal field. So that means that uh, whatever metric, uh, whatever coordinate uh, uh, gauge I have that's uh, close to Lorentz, I can just get this TT thing with a nice form for the metric just by, by taking only those components and uh, subtracting out the trace. So it's just a projection operator. So that's what this TT means. Uh, so now, what's missing here? So we took, we, we are generating a gravitational wave using a local distribution of matter, for instance a binary, that's moving slowly. Um, However, how is that binary moving? By gravity, right? It needs its own local gravitational field. Otherwise, it's not going to go around. It's just going to stay there. So this thing is not internally self-consistent because there's no, piece, there's no place for it to describe the actual uh, content, gravitational content of the field itself. So um, this description, as I've given here, would be okay uh, if I was... Uh, moving the masses in some other way. So, for instance, there's a, in the, in the Caltech um, astrophysics, uh, what they call the interaction room, there's a little contraption that somebody built, which is a gravitational wave generator. It's a dumbbell. It's two little masses connected to the rod, and there's, an, there's a motor that makes it rotate. And there's a nice gauge that actually says, uh, uh, you, you, you can increase the speed, you can, uh, you can, you can set the speed. And they, I should have taking a picture of it. And the, um, the part that I like best is that uh, it actually says caution, gravitational radiation. So, of course, you don't get too much out of that. But, uh, so if you do that, the description is perfect, okay? Because you have other forces that are moving the masses, 
and uh, uh, those forces, there are some stresses, internal stresses, but probably they, 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 they're very small and this description is fine. But if it's the gravitational field, the gravitational potential that's actually moving things around, maybe you, you have some trouble. And that's, uh, that's what was the origin of, uh, you know, confusion, because Einstein's uh, uh, equations had, uh, Einstein had this formula, actually he, he had a, a mistake by an error of a factor of two that Eddington fixed later, but he had that, but it was unclear whether that could be applied to something like a binary, which is bound by gravitation itself. So people say, that's why people said maybe the gravitation is going to match the even things out so that actually you don't have gravitational wave emission. Um, maybe the retarded field locally and so on just, just fixes everything and I've, we've got a beautiful self-consistent uh, solution. Um, the solution to this took a long time. Okay, it was only settled really, I think, in the 70s and 80s, although Landau and Lifshitz already maybe in 1950 or 47 in their textbook uh, had uh, a, a derivation based on uh, a full nonlinear expansion uh, of, the, uh, of the Einstein tensor, and they said, okay, it's all fine. It actually works in any case. If you, you just have to, to uh, formally, it works. But it, it was unclear to the Americans at least, and the, and, the, and the Brits and the Germans, that that was actually true. So one of the ways to, uh, to resolve this problem is, uh, is to look at uh, what they, what's called a two um, land scale expansion, or sometimes a matched asymptotic expansion. And the idea is the following, uh, is that uh, uh, if you're far enough, if you have a self-gravitating system, that's going to be your source of gravitational waves. If you're far enough, you're just seeing the waves, and the description that I, or propagation of the waves just applies. There's no problem there. Uh, if you go close enough, uh, you can go to a region where the metric, where, where you're far enough from, from the metric that um, the, the metric is going to look Newtonian. Okay, it's going to be a, a, just a weak perturbation on, uh, on Lorentz uh, with the dominant G00 term that's effectively one, what is it, minus time, twice the, the Newtonian potential. That's also a very accurate description of the metric of space-time in there. It's going to be time-dependent because these bodies are moving. So what, what you can do then is you're going to match uh, these two descriptions, these two metrics, in this weak field region in the near zone, okay, where both things are accurate, both the description of the wave going out and, both the, and the description of the uh, Newtonian um, field. If you do that, that's how it is in symbols, so, so don't, don't, take too, don't worry too much about it, but the point is that the Newtonian potential can be expanded in multiples. The, dom the first multiples is, of course, just the total mass of the system, which gives you your basic Coulomb potential. Uh, then there's a, there's a term in, uh, there's a dipole term that you can set to zero by, uh, you know, setting the, the center of motion of the system just at, at the origin. And then there's a quadrupole term. Okay. The same is true for a, uh, uh, the wave solution. If you write it as a spherical, in spherical symmetry, it's also going to have an object that uh, looks like a quadruple, okay, with the right, uh, right derivatives and so on. So if you match the two, you end up with exactly the same uh, equation that you had originally. And this tells you two things. It tells you that if, if you have a slowly moving, we need slow motion in this and a weakly gravitation, gravitating system, then uh, Einstein's formula uh, just applies as it is. Uh, you can actually prove that, uh, to, to great accuracy, that the uh, quadruple, mass quadruple tensor that generates waves is just the, um, the integral over the mass density that you expect. If uh, the source is strongly gravitating, so, say, a Newton star or so on. You cannot do that anymore. You cannot reliably take that integral. However, you can still go to this weak uh, gravity zone, and you can read off the Newtonian potential there and match that, again, to the, uh, to the quadruple, uh, quadruple that generates the wave. So that becomes like an effective okay, uh, quadruple potential uh, that uh, sources the waves. This is also what happens when you do post-Newtonian theory. So when you're taking corrections to this, uh, to, 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 to just Newtonian physics, you want to account for the energy of the field and so on. Uh, in effect, you're building a multipolar expansion of the, uh, of the potentials of the metric, and you're match the, matching them to the, um, to the source of the uh, gravitational wave. 
and, uh, and that matches, creates your effective uh, mass quadruple tensor. Okay, questions here, since I, I think I, I may have brought myself up a little. Five, okay. Okay, so then uh, um, we have to look at the binary, okay, prototypical source. Um, a very simple description, okay, two masses, different masses, separated by, uh, by, by some separation vector. Uh, we just compute the, um, the quadruple tensor. It's going to have the separation, the reduced mass, right, mu, and the phase of the, of the rotation. Take a double derivative, uh, pulls out two factors of the uh, orbital angular velocity. Let's just say this is just rotating at some orbital angular velocity. Plug this into the uh, quadruple formula. You get the two polarizations. Uh, the, if, you, if you put the rotation in the XY field and put yourself at the top looking down, it's actually very simple uh, because you're already in the TT frame. It's already only X, Y, and Z and no confusion. If you go at an angle, you have to do some uh, transformation of the basic vectors to project to the TT frame, and that gives you this uh, cosines of the inclination. And uh, you see, using Kepler's formula, you can relate, of course, uh, uh, the angular velocity to the velocity itself. And, uh, um, and so you get an expression for the, a very simple expression for the uh, gravitational wave polarizations, which have a, a velocity squared and just two phases of, of the rotation. Okay, so that's just a sinusoid. The entire waveform is proportional to mu, to, to, the, to the reduced mass, and there's a one over r tempered by, of course, constants uh, uh, that, that gives you the, you know, the decline of, of, the, uh, of the waves in, in a spherical fashion going, going out from the source. Now, um, <sighs> gravitational waves carry energy. So we can use the other piece that we did, okay? So the, uh, the energy tensor, the energy momentum tens content of the gravitational waves, we can compute the luminosity by integrating that across a sphere, taking the waves across the sphere, and that tells you how much energy is being carried away by the waves. So the expression is actually rather simple um, for, for that uh, uh, for the wave, and it involves a power of velocity to the 10th, and it involves a, uh, a, a, a constant which is the Larmor luminosity, which is a huge number, okay? The instantaneous gravitational luminosity um, for, for a binary is, a, a, is actually a huge number, and there's something interesting about that expression. So uh, this eta is uh, this uh, dimensional, dimensional mass ratio, so I'm giving it a, away a bit, but what's, what's interesting here? It has no mass left in there. So this is just, a, this is just a, a, a mass ratio, and this is a velocity. So this luminosity is only a function of how fast things are moving, but it's not a fast of how heavy they are. Um, so that, that means, among other things, that if you have the final inspiral for two black holes, the instantaneous luminosity from that system is, uh, is going to be the same no matter whether they're small black holes or large ones. However, the inspiral for the large ones takes longer Okay, so the overall amount of energy that are going to radiate is much, much bigger. But instantaneously, all binaries have the same, uh, the same luminosity. Then you can do something. You can compute your time to coalescence by, just by uh, matching the, the derivative effectively. But the, the, the workhorse for this kind of computation is this, an energy balance equation where we're going to take the expression for energy in the system. There's just in the Newtonian energy, okay? So uh, velocity mi minus uh, potential. And you're going to, to match the derivative of that to, the f to this luminosity of gravitational waves. So you're basically, physically, you're describing uh, how fast the energy of the system is changing because you, you're losing energy at infinity. This is, a, this is the simplest way to look at this. You, can, uh, you could also look at what the instantaneous effect is of uh, gravitational wave emission on the points, and that's much, much more complicated. That would be called the radiation reaction uh, computation. It's also somewhat gauge dependent, but this is the simplest way, and that's how people have been doing you know, this, uh, this thing in the trade. And uh, so from this energy balance equation, you can compute then what the evolution of frequency is and what the evolution of phase is. So that's my final expression for this Newtonian binary that's emitting gravitational waves uh, due to quadruple, the quadruple term only. And again, H plus and H cross, the two polarizations, there's a V squared, which is the instantaneous strength of the, uh, of the radiation. There is a mass here, a reduced mass, and there's a cosine of a phase which is evolving. 
and uh, this evolution with v to the minus 5, where v is the instantaneous velocity, uh, is the dominant Newtonian term. Okay, so uh, um, in practice, uh, we're going to use this, in fact, to try to, to estimate parameters in the, uh, in the LIGO detection uh, on Thursday. But in practice, you want to be a little more precise than that. And so you do what's called the post-Newtonian expansion. So, okay, formulas get a little more uh, um, ambitious there. But the point is that the energy and your flux, your luminosity, are going to have corrections with respect just to, to the Newtonian uh, expression because, uh, you know, after all, there's general relativity. There are no linear interactions between the masses and so on. So those corrections are written in terms of the velocity squared. And this piece here is what I had back here for energy, just minus 1 mu v squared. And then there are corrections written as an expansion as a series in velocity squared. The first term here would be the first post-Newtonian correction to the energy. Likewise, for uh, a luminosity, this is the dominant term, which is of order V10. Okay, and then you, you, have, uh, you have corrections. And then you can take these things, do the balance equation, and plug them back into your phasing. And you get this is an expression for phasing as a function of, again, velocity. And uh, uh, this is very similar to what's used in, in actual gravitational wave searches. Yes? I, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear anything. Is it independent of masses? Whether, whether this is independent of masses? Or so, or just um, it's in, uh, it, it, uh, so these, uh, these, these energy and fluxes are normalized. So, so the flux, as we said, is independent of, of mass. This energy, when you write it like that, is divided by, by mass. So it's, uh, it's energy density or energy divided by mass. So these expressions are, uh, only depend on mass ratios, these zetas. However, when you put them together to, uh, to make a waveform, the mass does provide the scale of it. So if you go to 10 times the mass, you're just stretching time effectively by, by 10 times, and you're changing energy also. But it's, it's symmetric in this way, yeah. So um, the other thing that I didn't show you is that there's a very specific combination of masses that enters in the, the frequency change as a function of time. That's what's known as the chirp mass. Uh, we talk more about it on, on Thursday. But then this kind of expression is what gives you then these uh, post-Newtonian uh, waveforms, which are very good descriptions of the spiral, uh, as far as the spiral is slow enough that uh, you know, things are evolving slowly. Remember the... Um, to define uh, energy momentum, we needed to take averages over several wavelengths. So that means that uh, this energy balance, I can only do it if, uh, you know, if, if it's proceeding slowly with respect to, uh, to the evolution of frequency. When things start to change very fast at the end, you need to do something else, either analytically or using numerical relativity computers, and you get a merger, something that's not like a, you know, it's not like a circular binary at all. It's, it's quite complex. Uh, there, there are, of course, many complications here if you bring in spin. Spin is very interesting because it brings its, all, its own dynamics and, uh, um, and so on. But that's the, the, the basic uh, um, cir your circular um, waveform. Okay, so going back to my scheme, we went through all of them. It was a bit of a slog, but, uh, um, and, uh, you know, and... and there are indices, there are formulas, and so on. Uh, but for each of them, if you spend a couple of hours <laughs> looking at the equation and uh, matching them and so on, I, I think you can convince yourself that it corresponds to a very basic physical uh, statement. So, you know, it's all physics. It's, uh, it's not mathematics, and uh, they're, they're very physical things. You can build experiments that, uh, that measure gravitational waves. Uh, and you can look at binaries and see that they, they evolve because of them. Um, so, you know, general relativity over 100 years went from being mathematics to, to physics. So that's my story for today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.